All right, hello, my name is Richard, and today we're gonna to be solving some math problems as requested by you guys over at the One Class website. If you require any more additional help with your homework or any other tutoring services, be sure to check out the links in the description below. So with that being said, let's get started with the set of problems. So first off, um, as we can see here for our first question, we're presented with four different graphs and we're asked which graph best represents this function f of x. So we write out f of x right now as f of x is equal to 0 0.5 times 4 to the x. And um, the good thing about these kind of problems is that you can generally just test each of the points that they give us for each of the graphs to determine which graph best represents f of x. So that's what we're going to do for this problem. So for answer choice A, we're going to go through each answer choice individually, but um, we're going to plug and test the points and see if they do agree with f of x. So first, at x equals 0, we're going to evaluate the function for answer choice A right here, this graph. So we're going to get 0.5 times 4 to the 0, which will just give us 0.5. And as you can see here, the point is very close to 0.5, but we have to keep going and test every other um, important x value on the graph. So we're going to test out f of 2, because that is the next x value where we have a point right here. So plugging in 2 into this, we get 0.5 times 4 to the second is equal to 8. All right. And then we can look at our graph and we can see that yes, this point actually does lie on 8. So, so far so good. Afterwards, we're going to test the final x value, which is at x equals 3. And at x equals 3, we're going to evaluate this function. So this is going to be 0.5 times 64, which is 32. And as we can see right here, at x equals 3, this function does return a value of 32, and it's graphed at 3 comma 32, so I would already go with answer choice A being the correct one. Now, just to make sure that we're right, uh, we're going to go through the other graphs and see any other problems. So, evaluating the function at, for example, x equals 0 right here for answer choice B, we see that it's giving us a value of around 4 at x equals 0, but as you can see by this box right here, we did find that it's 0.5. So we can rule out answer choice B for that reason. And then looking at answer choice C, we evaluated F at the X value 3 over here, and it's not 8 as it says in answer choice C. It's actually 32. So we can rule out answer choice C as well. Then we can look at answer choice D, and once again, um, we can see that f of 2 in answer choice D is set to be 32, but it is 8 in our case. So for that reason, we can rule out answer choice D. So answer choice A is the correct answer choice for this problem. And just looking through what was said in the written response, um, it seems like it's on point. And yeah, this is, this is an accurate answer right here saying that answer choice A is the only correct option. So I'm just going to write that the solution is correct. Good job. Okay, and mark it as correct. All right, seem to be having bit of an issue here. So let's just write that again. For some reason I'm getting an error thrown as I'm trying to submit that. So all right. So we're on to the next question here. Okay. So, for this next question, we are given a function f of x, so we can write it out as so, f of x is equal to x cubed minus 2x squared. 
and we are told to evaluate the function at an x value of i. All right, so i, as you, as we might all know, is just the square root of negative one. It is um, a fundamental concept, and um, there are some properties that we can write down here which are going to be useful for solving this uh, this problem. So, for example, if we were to take i squared, that would just be multiplying i by itself, which is the same thing as multiplying the square root of minus one times the square root of minus one. And we all know if we multiply two square roots with the same value in the square root, then we just get what's inside of it. So negative one. And then we can say the same thing about i cubed. It's another property. So um, i cubed would just be i squared times i which we already found what i squared is, which is negative one, and i is just the square root of negative one. So in other words, it's just negative i, right? Um, that's, that's a more shorthand way of writing it. And then i to the fourth is um, pretty straightforward. It would just be i squared times i squared. So that would be negative one times negative one, and that's just one. And normally how i works is as you progress sort of past three, so i to the third, the values tend to repeat themselves. So for example, i to the first would equal i to the fifth, which would equal i to the ninth, and so on and so forth. But um, that's not really necessary for this problem. So getting back to it, uh, by substituting in i into this equation, we get i cubed minus two i squared. And if we just look at the values, the exponent values of i that we just found, we see that i squared right here is equal to negative one. So we know that we can just substitute in negative one for this i squared. And i cubed is equal to negative i. So we could just plug in negative i for i cubed. Afterwards, um, negative two times negative one, we get a positive two. So we could just rewrite this as two minus i. And then this would be our answer right here. So let's just have a look at how the written solution was done. So yes, we have old i squared and i cubed written out here for this problem and they did find that two minus i is the correct solution and that is answer choice d. So I'm just going to write that that is correct solution. Great job. All right. I'm not sure why I'm getting this error thrown right now. seems to be something wrong here. I apologize. Okay, so we're just gonna keep on moving here with the questions. So let's drag this away. All right, so for this next question, we are trying to determine what must be a factor of this polynomial function f of x graphed on the coordinate plane as shown right here. So the first thing that we can observe are the roots of the parabola, right? So we know that every single um, parabola can be written in a form where you can explicitly write it as a product of its roots, if, if possible, so if, if those roots exist. 
So in this case, we have two roots. We have one root at x equals 2 and another root at x equals 6. So we actually do know what the equation for this parabola is quite easily. So if we were to write the equation for this, so let's assume that our two roots, so our roots are a and b, then we can actually just write this as x minus a times x minus b, where the value of a and b are the x value of the location of our roots. And just to remind everybody what a root is, it is basically a point where the function passes through the x-axis. So as you can see here, it passes through the x-axis at the point 2, 0, and once again at the point 6, 0. So with that being said, we can say that our roots are at x equals 2 and x equals 6. Right? Knowing the location of our roots, we could then plug them in for a and b, and we get that f of x is equal to x minus 2 times x minus 6. And now the question asks, which is a factor of this function? And we know that the factor of this function would have to be x minus 2, because it's, little, it's literally a factor that we get from writing our parabola in factor form. So for that reason, we know that x minus 2 is the solution to this problem. And as we can see in this work right here, um, option B is the correct answer. That is option B. And x equals 2, that means are the factors since the point where the x-axis is called the zeros of the given curve. Yep. So the solution is correct. And great job. All right, so that concludes this question. So once again, getting an error thrown. Why does it do this? Okay, I'm not sure what's going on here. Okay, so I guess we're moving on to the next question here. So let's drag this all away and work on the next question. So is zero an integer? So this is a very simple question. Um, when you think of the set of all integers, so um, we think of zero, yes, being in the middle, and then counting all whole numbers, both positive and negative. So those that is the definition of the integers, and normally, in more mathematical notation, this is the symbol. It's a Z with a little uh, slash through it. Not necessary to know, but it's basically the set of all integers, and we know that zero is one of them because an integer is defined as uh, any whole number that can be counted as long as it's not a fraction. So again, a whole number is not a fraction. So for example, uh, we could take negative 105. Yes, negative 105 is an integer. It's a whole number. And um, regardless of the sign, it falls into the set of integers. If we take something like 3 fifths, 3 fifths is not an integer because it's a fraction. So that's a pre pretty easy distinction between um, integers and what we call rational numbers. So 3 fifths would be a rational number. Negative 105 is an integer. So um, this should be pretty straightforward in terms of the text-based answer. And saying that right here, there are two types of integers. Yes, so there's positive integers and negative integers. And then... Um, saying yes, so the, the neutral integer is basically what zero is. It, it's a whole number. Obviously, zero does not have a sign, but because it's neither negative or positive, it's considered neutral. 
and um, it's it's basically the most unique integer of its kind. So um, I'm just going to write the solution is correct. Good job. And that concludes this question. Once again, I'm getting this error right here. Okay, so we have a pretty detailed answer here. Um, I'm willing to go through all the details here. So let's just drag this away and get started on the next question. Okay, so how do you convert 720th as a decimal and a percent? So a few things we have to keep in mind. So what is a percent first of all? So let's say you have um, certain parts of a whole, right? Um, so let's say we have something right here and we have five parts of it, right? So five equal parts obviously might not be perfectly drawn here. And let's say that out of this whole, you own one part. So as a fraction, we can pretty easily determine this to be one fifth, right? Um, when we deal basically what percents are, we're talking about parts out of, not out of five parts of a whole, but we're talking about a hundred parts. That's basically the standard of what a definition of a percent is. So let's assume we had the same situation here, but we had um, about, let's say, a hundred little boxes, don't really want to draw them out, but we own five of the boxes. So this right here would be five out of 100. And universally, because we're talking about 100 parts, we could call this 5%. So basically what you have to keep in mind whenever you're trying to convert anything into a percent, you're trying to make sure that your total number of parts are at 100. So let's take this example to our question. So our question is, how do you convert 7 out of 20? So when you look at 7 out of 20, the first thing we notice is that there's what we call 20 parts. We want to get 100 parts. In order to do that, we know that we can multiply the numerator and the denominator by any numbers we want as long as we do it to both the top and the bottom. So in this case, in order to get 100, I would have to multiply the top and the bottom by 5 over 5. After doing that, we get that 7 over 20 is equal to 35 over 100. And now we have a similar situation as in this 100 box problem, where we have 100 parts and 35 of them are ours. So as a standard, we could say that it is 35%. Because whenever we're talking about a fraction with 100 parts, we can write the numerator as a percent. And that is basically what we do with any problem. Whenever you have a fraction and you want it to be a percent, you have to convert the denominator, which is the no total number of parts, to 100. Obviously multiply the numerator and the denominator accordingly. So 35% would be our answer, but we are also looking for the decimal. Now, in terms of decimals, we can use something universal. So how you convert from decimal to percent or percent to decimal is we know that 0 0.01 is equal to 1%. Because if we are talking about parts of a whole, correct? So um, basically 1 is equal to 100%. So 1 is everything. It is all of our 100 parts, right? If we take 35% of that, essentially we are multiplying 0 0.01 by 35. Because if the exchange um, formula correct, the exchange rate between 1% is 0 0.01. So to convert back and forth, 
you would multiply 0 0.01 by 35 and get 0.35 as your equivalent decimal. And the same idea actually holds when we're talking about fractions. So in the case of 35 over 100, when we had 35 over 100, if you have the parts on the bottom equal to 100, you can actually just write this as 0.35 or 35 percent. It's all about getting the denominator to be 100. So you could use the percent standard, and in that way you can write it as a decimal as well. So let's just look at what the answer, the written answer is here. So it does go pretty in depth. Fraction forms writing any quantity p over q, where q does not equal zero. Yes, that is correct for fractions. Percent form and fraction form are interchangeable. That's what I'm trying to say right here. So where I'm circling, they are in fact interchangeable and they mean the same thing and it's very easy to go between the two. Um, if a quantity is given fraction form, multiply that quantity by 100 to find the equivalent percent form of that quantity. Um, yeah, that's, that, that's another way to do it. You can just multiply the fraction by 100% and you get 50%. But this is just the way that I like to do it. I like to convert the fraction denominator to have 100. Um, that is how I do it, but this way works fine as well. Um, so we have that. A fraction can be converted to decimal by division. Um, yes, that is actually also true. So another thing right here is in, if you don't want to change the denominator to be 100, what you can do is you could just divide. So I'm just going to go through the division right here. So 7 divided by 20. And obviously, when the uh, what you are dividing by is larger than um, than this number inside of the division, we have to add a decimal point and add a zero. In fact, adding a zero up here as well. And then we have to add um, another zero here. So we treat this quantity as 700 and divided by 20. So get three right here. So 60. So we treat this like a long division problem get a 10 here, drop the 0, and then we get the 5 going up there. This is clean division right here, and our answer would be 7 over 20 in decimal form. So this example um, that he gives right here, dividing 17 by 40, that works as well. And then 19 over 50, so these are some good examples, so I'm going to say that is that proof is correct. Great use of examples. All right. Once again, getting this error thrown. So I'm just going to refresh the page and hope that I'm doing the right thing here. So let's move on to the next question here. So Given a right triangle, what is the value of tangent of f? So let's draw this right triangle on our book, our notebook here. So we have f, d, and e. I apologize for that e. OK, and then the sides are 41, 40, and 9. So what we have to know about both or all three of the trigonometric values, sine, cosine, and tangent. Uh, tangent specifically, we have to address the definition of tangent, but I'm going to go over both sine and cosine as well. So considering our angle of choice is angle F right here, we're going to define what the sine, cosine, and tangent of F are. So the sine of any angle uh, is the opposite side of that angle divided by the hypotenuse. And now in case you're unfamiliar with what the hypotenuse is, the hypotenuse is this diagonal side right here. It is the longest side of a right triangle, not to be confused with the legs of the right triangle, which are this 9 and this 40. So these are the legs. And this is the hypotenuse. Okay. So um, the standard is you take the opposite side. So in this case, our opposite side, 
So sine of angle F, going to write in this way. Our opposite side in this case is 40, so this leg divided by 41. All right, simple enough. We move on to the cosine of theta, which is just the adjacent side. Adjacent meaning the side not opposite the side right next to. So the adjacent side of this angle divided by the hypotenuse. The adjacent side also meaning the adjacent leg. So obviously not the hypotenuse over the hypotenuse. Um, so the cosine of angle F, we would get it to be the adjacent side, which is 9 right here. So 9 divided by the hypotenuse, which is once again 41. And now the tangent of angle F, finally, is the opposite side divided by the adjacent side. In other words, it's actually just sine of the angle over cosine. So you can do this either way. Obviously, this way that I'm boxing right here is more complicated. You would have to calculate sine and cosine. I would not recommend doing that, but I just thought it would be um, important to go over those concepts. So if we just go about it this way, we choose the opposite side, which is 40. The opposite side from angle F is 40. And then the adjacent side is the only leg that's left, so that's 9. And our answer here would be 40 over 9. Obviously, if you need some sort of decimal form, you can evaluate it using a calculator. But in fractional form, this is the answer. And um, this written answer right here does a good job. Um, basically, does not go through sine and cosine, but hits the nail on the head when it comes to tangent. So uh, this solution is correct. Good job. So there, obviously, hit with another error here. Um, not sure what is going on but if I refresh I should get the next question okay so let's clean all this up from the last question and move on to the next one so the constraints of a problem are listed below what are the vertices of the feasible region so we're gonna draw our coordinate plane first of all and we're going to go through this problem step by step. So the way I like to think of it first is considering the um, hard boundaries. So the hard boundaries here would be that x is less than or equal to 0 and y is greater than or equal to 0. So this is going to constrain our answer to one of the quadrants. So if our x value has to always be less than or equal to 0. So our x axis is here, our y axis is here. So if x must always be less than or equal to 0, we are going to be constrained for now to work in this plane right here. So the left half side of the coordinate plane. If y has to be greater than or equal to 0, so um, meaning it has to be above the x-axis, then we are now constrained to just this quadrant. Okay. So that's important to know. So that takes care of two of our constraints. We know that we're going to be working in this quadrant right here, which is quadrant two. So it's going to be circle quadrant two right here. OK. And now we can actually start working with the lines that go into this, um, in, into this quadrant. So I like to rewrite the actual um, constraints in terms of equations of lines or inequalities of lines. So I'm going to change them first into a format where y is isolated. So I'm going to subtract x on both sides, and I'm going to get 3y is less than or equal to 6 minus x. Then I'm going to divide by 3 on both sides, and I'm going to get y is less than or equal to 2 minus 1 thirds x. So this tells me two things, this constraint right here. First, it tells me about what the y-intercept is. So the y-intercept is, so just a uh, reminder, 
the y-intercept is the value without a, a, the variable x in front of it when we're talking about inequalities or equations of lines. So this is the intercept, and this is the slope, telling us what direction the line is going in. If it's, go, if it's a positive slope, line's going up, negative slope, line's going down, and um, how steep it is. So we know that the intercept of this line is going to be 2, and we know that it's going to have a negative slope. So um, the line itself, so let's wait off to dry. Let's get the other constraint first, actually, just so we get the vertices. So um, we're going to convert this and isolate y. So I'm going to subtract by 4x, get 6y is greater than minus 4x plus 9. And then I'm going to divide by 6 on both sides. So y is greater than or equal to minus 2 thirds. It's 4 over 6. x plus 9 over 6 is 3 halves. So this tells us one more thing, that um, our other intercept here is going to be at 3 halves. So let's assume this is 2 and this is 3 halves. So the other thing that it's telling us is that um, at some, okay, just probably this, this person has drawn it better than I can. So these lines will intersect, so they both have negative slopes, correct? So as you can see from the images here, because they have negative slopes, um, the one with the y-intercept of 2 actually has a less steeper slope, so it's going to look something like this. And this is this slope is two times steeper, right here, because we have a minus two thirds slope versus a minus one thirds. So the um, the second line, the one with the intercept at three halves, will have a steeper slope. So it's going to look something like this. And now they both have negative slopes, but they will intersect at some point here. And we have to find the value of this point. So Finding the value of this point is as simple as saying, as setting both equations equal to each other, the ones that we found here, because we want to find what common point they share. So what common x value do they share? Because obviously, if two lines intersect, they have to have a point of intersection, meaning they share the same x value and the same y value of that point of intersection. So if we can find that point, then essentially we found our region. So our region, remember we're working in, in the second quadrant, and our region will be bounded by these three points right here that we've drawn. So let's set them equal to each other. So we're going to have 2 minus 1 thirds x equals minus 2 thirds x plus 3 halves. And I'm going to add 1 thirds x to this side, and I'm going to get minus 1 thirds x plus 3 halves. I am going to subtract 3 halves to this side. I'm going to get 1 half is equal to minus 1 thirds x. And to isolate x, I am going to multiply by minus 3 on both sides. And I'm going to get that x is minus 3 halves. So we have the x value of intersection. Now we just have to find the corresponding y value. By doing that, you could just plug it into either one of the equations since both equations share the same point of intersection. So I'm going to choose to do it on the first equation. It looks a lot simpler to solve, potentially. Um, so actually, let's go with the second one. So y is equal to minus 2 thirds. I'm going to plug in minus 3 halves here and I'm going to add 3 halves. And as we can see here, get my pencil back, um, right here this term just goes to 1, and we're going to add that to 3 halves, so that's the same thing as 2 over 2 plus 3 halves, and finally we get that y is 5 halves. So we found our point of intersection. Our point of intersection is minus 3 halves and 5 halves. 
and the points that make up our boundary would be the two intercepts here that we found and this point of intersection. So our two intercepts both have an x value of 0 and their y value is the value of the intercept. So uh, we're going to write that the first intercept 0, 2 and the second intercept 0, comma, 3 halves. These three points make up our boundary. Um, so that's the solution. Uh, more specifically, answer choice C, I believe. Yes, answer choice C. So let's just look through the work here. Um, obviously, the work that went into these images, very well done, and um, actually showing what the feasible region is inside of here, um, and showing the vertices that we found as well. So the math that was actually used to find it isn't shown here. But, um, you know, hopefully uh, you could see from this video how it's done and it could be found this way. So, um, great use in the, the solution. Okay, the solution is correct. Once again, I have a problem here. All right. So, oops. Let's drag all of this out of here and let's get to 100%. All right. So, the next question What is the area of the shaded region in the given circle in terms of pi and in simplest form. Okay, so let's take a look at the circle right here. So we're going to draw it out. I'm going to have O, going to some P, some point R, some point Q, this line here, I apologize for the bad drawing, but um, we're going to have an angle here of 60 degrees, and we know that the radius is 6 meters. Okay. So, all right. First thing we notice, correct uh, observation notice in the solution, is that if we have an angle of 60 degrees in any triangle right here and two of the sides are equal so we know that since this is a radius and this is a radius that means that these two angles must also be equal right the only degree amount left to set so so let's assume that the value of this angle is x the value of this angle is y we know that x has to be equal to y, that x plus y have to add up to 120 degrees because um, obviously 180 degrees total for the whole triangle. So this implies that if we can substitute x in for y, 2x equal to 120 and x equal to 60 degrees. So that's how we show that this is an equilateral triangle. Now the way that we actually find the area of the shader region, it's everything except for this part. So I'm going to shade this part as I can't really shade the entire thing without ruining the graphic. And I'm going to shade this entire part and we have to find the rest of it. So if we can find the area of the entire, the entire circle and subtract it out from here, then we're fine. So first of all, we're going to find the actual area of this segment. Right, so, uh, hold on a second. So, wait, I'm sorry, what is the area of the shader region? Okay, yeah, I got that right. I thought we were finding this little part here. <clears throat> so we have to find the actual segment and subtract the majority that's missing the small piece from the triangle. So we write the area down here Basically, it's going to be a fraction of the total angle of the circle, which is 360 degrees. So as it's done in here, 
that is the correct way to approach it and we know that our radius so this is our area right here and we're writing it as a fraction of the angle that we're given so um, in this case we're talking about this slice right here we're finding this area of this slice and we are subtracting out here this part all right so this is the area of that slice and then we are subtracting out the actual area of the triangle right here so area of the slice minus area of the triangle okay so the area of the triangle is pretty straightforward so when we have an equilateral triangle we assume a height right here so this is an angle 90 this is an angle 30 degrees and it's going to be one half base times height right so if we go one half base times height so the height so sorry the base here is our radius so times six and our height here would basically just be so height and sorry my bad so uh, sine of 60 degrees is equal to our height divided by our radius so our height and the sine of 60 degrees we know is radical 3 over 2 um, so sine of 60 degrees times our radius which is 6 okay and then from there wait I might be doing something wrong here okay so evaluating this here so okay I apologize one second okay yeah so area of the triangle here we have six coming in for our radius this side is six as well size six as well this side right here we would find this H right here our base is three my bad our base should be three in this case so we would have sine of okay yeah so cosine 60 that works out sine of 60 is equal to h over 6 and in this case the sine of 60 is root 3 over 2 times 6 so 3 root 3 okay so that's the value of our h so we would have 1 half 3 root 3 so that would be our height times our base okay so evaluating that we would have 60 degrees over 360 degrees times pi times our radius which we found to be 6 and then right here we would have a 9 halves root 3 and then we would do uh, 1 sixth pi times 36 which will just give us 6 pi in the next line and then minus 4.5 root 3 okay and then we would get 6 pi minus 4.5 root 3 uh, okay in that case I'm actually looking at this solution and I'm wondering why we're doing it this way so obviously that's sine 60 times so they're finding the area of the sector OPRQ OPRQ so that would just be one-sixth of the entire thing so that would be one-sixth of the entire thing so that's 6 pi subtracted from the area of the triangle OPQ finding OPQ here we have 6 and 6 so just once again gonna find this triangle and see if the solution is wrong or not so taking it from this perspective we know this is 3 we know this is 6 we know this is H so sine of 60 is going to equal H over 6 so root 3 over 2 
equal to h over 6. So h is 3 root 3. Finding the area of this triangle here is just 1 half base times height. So I think this is where we might have went wrong here in this problem. It's that they did not divide by 2 for this term right here. So as you can see here, I believe that this should be 4 and a half root 3. So let's just continue on with the problem. Uh, and we are going to get the following. Uh, area of the given circle, yes. So this is just the area of the small part, or I apologize. Yeah, this is the area of the small part. So, because essentially what we've done is we've calculated this entire region here, subtracted out the triangle here. Okay. I'm just double checking here. Would not want to be wrong. Okay. So then the route that the person takes in this problem is the correct route. So if this is the small part here, right here, and we want to find the area of everything, we take the area of everything and subtract it from the small part. So the area of everything as we know it is pi r squared and subtracted from the small part. The small part in this case would be pi r squared minus 6 pi minus four and a half root three. All right. So in this case, uh, we can evaluate it to be pi times six squared minus six pi, and then uh, plus 4.5 root three. And then we would find it to be, this is 36 pi, so we'd get 30 pi plus four and a half root three. Okay, and obviously because we're talking about meters here and we're talking about area, we should have meters squared in the answer. So I am just going to look over this one more time because I like to be certain. Um, so times side squared. Ah, okay, yeah, sorry guys. So I only found the area of a single triangle here. So this that I computed here, that is completely my fault here. Um, I only computed the area of a single triangle. So this, uh, this four and a half right here, we should multiply this entire term by two. So the solution as stated is correct. So I apologize about the work this should be a 9 and this should be a 9 as well and this should be a 9. Let me just explain my error here. Um, I only found the um, this 3 root 3 is the area if we this is the entire triangle I only found it of one half of it. So I should have multiplied my result by 2. So that's a silly mistake by me that times 2 should go here. So I hope you could have followed along with all of that mess, but I believe that as it's written here, this explanation, this text-based explanation is a lot better than the one that I've provided. So, um, great solution, good job. Okay, yeah, so the solution as provided is correct. Oh, sorry about making mistakes there. Okay. So which pair of equations generates graphs with the same vertex? So let's go over this. And we can um, go over a key concept here. So we're talking about a bunch of parabolas here. And um, to note, first and foremost, is that parabolas should have the same, in, in, in order to have two parabolas with the same vertex, they must have the same axis of symmetry. And um, the axis of symmetry is definitely is usually found by um, by taking the so let's first start with the equation of a parabola so we get ax squared plus bx plus
plus c is the general equation. So um, looking at answer choice a, for example, if we were to actually expand upon both equations here, so I'm going to multiply out them as they are. So we're going to get minus x squared plus 8x plus 16. And um, we're going to get y equals x squared plus 8x plus 16. And I'm just going to distribute the negative sign here. And the first thing that you'll notice between these two equations is that if we're finding the axis of symmetry, we want to use the fact x equals b over 2a to find what x value the actual um, the axis of symmetry is at. So in this case, our b value would be the value next to x. So for the first equation, our b value is negative 8, while in our second equation, our b value is 8. Right? So plugging in a as well, we're going to get that negative 8 over negative 2. We're going to get 8 over 2, and we find that they're both at 4. So that in itself would be, OK, wait, sorry about that. A more simpler way to approach this, as I'm just realizing it, is seeing at what x values we get a minimum at. So scratch what I've said, and at the answer choice a, uh, we see that both equations at x equals minus 4 and x equals 4 are the two values that make it go at a minimum. Now, um, actually seeing both of these equations here, we know that uh, that because they have different values of vertices, so meaning where the equation is at a minimum, or where the vertex is located, wherever y is equal to 0, we can automatically rule out answer choice A. Now answer choice B is compelling, because if we look at both equations, so y equals minus 4x squared and y equals 4x squared, we see that at x equals 0, um, both equations have a vertex mainly because they're both at either at, at, their, at their minimum with this equation or at their maximum with this equation. Um, that is either their lowest or their highest point. And because both values or both equations also give the same result at the same x value, right? So if you evaluate this first equation at x equals zero, you will get zero. And if you evaluate the second equation, at x equals 0, you also get 0. It means that both vertices are 0, 0. So we could kind of just stop right there because we found that both vertices here are 0, 0, meaning that they do share the same vertex. If we go through the other results, um, answer choice C, you could see, is wrong because um, this C value right here that we've discussed previously, so plus 4 and minus 4, are the offset for the parabola, meaning if it's going to go, if it's a positive offset, the parabola will go higher by, f by four in this case for the second equation. Or that if the parabola has a negative four offset value for C, it's going to go four units lower. For that reason, they, their vertex can't be at the same place if all of their points are shifted. So for that reason, they can't share the same vertex. And the same reasoning goes here. Um, twofold, firstly because of the offset, and second because again at the, the value of their vertices are different. So here um, we get that the vertex has to be at 4, while here the minimum value is at 0, right? So for that reason they can't share the same vertex, even though they both point in the same direction because their a values are positive. So it has to be coming back to this answer choice B to be the correct answer. And as we can see, this in-depth explanation here, um, yeah, just going in to show how the vertices are the same and comparing uh, all the equations and find that B is the correct answer. So that is the correct solution. Good job. So 
again with the issues. Uh, definitely having trouble with these issues here. So, next question. We are looking at inequalities of a graph with a solid line through the points 0, minus 2. So let's draw our uh, coordinate plane. So here we have x and here we have y. And sorry, the point 0, negative 2 can be found down here. And the point 2, comma 1 can be found over here. And we can draw a line that passes through both of these points. And it says that the inequality has a solid line through the points with shading above. So let's put some shading here and the line is solid. So what the solid line means is that we're going to see that y will be greater than or equal to some function of x because it is taking in all of the points above the line. And the fact that it's solid means that we're including this greater than or, or equals to. If it were a dotted line, we would just do greater than, right? Because we don't care about the values on the line, but since it's greater than or equal to, we do care about those values. So we have to construct the line that defines um, y. And to do that, we need two pieces of information. We need the intercept and we need the slope. Um, we know the intercept because it's the value at which x equals zero. So this point right here is our intercept, and we know that it is at y equals negative 2. And we need the slope, which is calculated by finding the rise over the run of our two points. So y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So in this case, we're going to take our, y, our 2 to be the second point and our 1 to be this first point. So we're going to have 1 minus negative 2, the two y values divided by 2 minus 0. And we're going to get a slope of 3 halves. So we have our slope, we have our intercept, and we can write our inequality as y is greater than or equal to 3 halves x minus 2. So as we can see in the answer choices, that's not enough. We actually need to get rid of any fractions and kind of rearrange the terms to find the correct answer. So I'm just going to add 2 on this side because we can do that with inequalities. And we're going to get y plus 2 is greater than or equal to 3 halves x. Then I'm going to multiply the entire inequality by 2 to get rid of the fraction. So I'm going to get 2y plus 4 is greater than or equal to 3x. And then finally, I see that a lot of the answer choices here have the constant um, by itself. So I'm going to subtract this 2y to that side. So I'm going to get 4 greater than or equal to 3x minus 2y. And I'm going to look at my answer choices now. So A, 3x minus 2y is greater than or equal to 4. So no, we need... Um, the other way of writing this is 3x minus 2y is less than or equal to 4, which is definitely not what A says. Then 3x minus 4y, we don't have a 4y in our answer. And then 3x minus 2y is less than or equal to 4. So here I would definitely take C to be the correct answer, um, as it is the only correct answer choice. And um, I'm going to look at the work here. And... Let's see what's going on here. So this person actually made the mistake of, okay, so I believe what they did was 3x minus 2y is equal to 4. Okay, so we got that, got that. So same thing I had, 2 plus y is greater than or equal to 3 fourths. So we had y is greater than or equal to this line, meaning that it's up here. And um, we added by 2, we multiplied by 2 on both sides, and then we, um, we rearranged it this way. And I believe what he messed up is he meant to say that 3x minus 2y has to be less than or equal to 4. Because if we take a random point here, so sorry, I just can't really use this. So if we take a point zero, 0, 
um, we know this inequality is actually correct because if we were to plug in 0, 0, which is obviously a point in here, we plug in a 0, 0, that means that it's in here and it actually works out on the inequality because we get 0 minus 0 is less than or equal to 4, which is true. So that's how we know this inequality actually works. So I would write here that the solution is actually answer choice C, um, 3x minus 2y is less than or equal to 4, yep. I believe that you mix up the direction of your greater than equal sign, equal sign as it can be, as you can disprove your Answer in your last image by test point zero comma zero. Okay, um, and we're gonna say a solution. Oh no, I did not mean to say that. Okay, either way, uh, we are going to wrap things up here, and. I'd like to thank everyone for watching, and hopefully um, I answered your questions to the best of my ability, and I will see you next time that I'll be answering questions. Thank you very much.